this today in our Connect Group video. We're going to start a whole new section this week as we do each week. We're going to be looking at um, eternal life and what it looks like to live in the presence of God for all of eternity. And so uh, speaking of living somewhere, um, we have not lived here that long. Me and my family, we've only been here for uh, a few months, not even a year yet. And so it's kind of crazy. We're in the midst of all this with COVID-19, uh, just as we've kind of really begun to get a stride in ministry here. And so one of the things obviously that we had to do when we moved here was find a place to live. So we were very fortunate to have a wonderful rental property for a few months until we could find something more permanent. And as we were beginning to look for places, uh, many of you were telling us, hey, this is a good area to live in, and, and this is a good area to live in. And, and so Lizzie and I, we were trying to decide the best place for our family, right? We wanted to be uh, kind of southwest Van Cleef, just so Lizzie's commute wouldn't be that far. She works in Gulfport. And, and so we kind of tried to find places there, had, had a really hard time doing that. And eventually we ended up settling uh, in a house off of Old River. And so actually the exact opposite direction of where we wanted to be. But uh, when we found the house, it was it was so perfect for us. We loved the home. We really we actually loved the neighborhood, the location of the house, and it was it was perfect for us. Uh, you know, even if it wasn't exactly where we thought we wanted to be, we found that the commute wasn't that bad for her. And again, we we loved that neighborhood. The house was awesome. The yard was awesome. Our kids enjoyed it. It was a great home that we hope to do ministry out of with our students and our church for many years to come. And uh, and so for us, it was it was perfect for us. But the truth is, our house wouldn't be perfect for everyone. Some people would look and say, hey, man, that house isn't big enough. You know, I've got 17 kids or, or whatever, and I need a bigger house for us to live in, right? Or some people would say, hey, I want a mile between me and my neighbor. I don't want anyone to even know that I exist. I want to be so far back in the woods. We lived in a house like that at one time. and But then some people would say, man, that's too much yard. You know, I want... Uh, an itty bitty yard. I want a yard that I can cut in five minutes with a push mower. You know, I, I, I want to be in a different type of neighborhood or, or I don't want to be in a neighborhood at all or, or whatever. I mean, where you live is, is all about the location, right? It's all about what works for you. You know, you're going to, you're going to buy a house uh, buy or buy a plot of land to build a house that fits your needs and your budget and what you can do because it's centered around what, what you want. Uh, and the, but the reality is even when you get what you want, it's still not perfect, is it? Um, it's there's still always going to be issues, you know. Even with our house, we love our house, but I mean, I, this afternoon, uh, uh, what the day after I'm filming this, I'm, I'm going to be tiling a, a bathroom floor because it's not perfect. Because there are things that we want to work on, and even when I finish all this, when I've done everything I could possibly do, it still won't be perfect, right? Because it still exists in this world. And so this week, we're going to be looking at. Uh, our eternal home. Like if you're a believer, we're going to be looking at the place where we're going to live for all of eternity. And, and I'm excited to talk with you about that. I'm excited to, to look at the place that finally will be perfect for everyone that will meet all of our needs because our needs will be perfectly in line with the glory of God. And so we're going to jump into Revelation here uh, today. And then throughout this week, we'll continue to study in God's word. But today we're going to be in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, to start with, and then we'll continue to read on. So I'm going to go ahead and read this passage for us and jump in. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be, and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more, because the previous things have passed away. And then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Write, because these words are faithful and true. So Revelation 21 kind of begins with this, awesome picture where uh, all of our experience, right, all of our pain and frustration and, and conflict and suffering, uh, all these things that we face in our world today, a place where they, they'll no longer exist, where they won't be an issue. Uh, it's a, a new heaven and a new earth, right? It's not new in just the, the sense of time, right? It's new in its quality, right? It's significantly better than anything that we could imagine, better than anything we've ever experienced, 
in our life. And, and so that's what John is describing here in his, in his vision. But then he kind of continues to go on, right? He calls it the new heaven and the new earth. But then he says, hey, man, I see a holy city, right? The new Jerusalem. And he calls it its beautiful bride. I think this is a perfect picture, especially for those of us who are married, right? We, we can remember back, men, you can remember back to the time when your wife was walking down the aisle towards you. And if you're, if you're like me, I was sitting there thinking like, okay, I fooled her this long. How much longer can I fool her? All I got to do is just get her to say I do. You know, I mean, because I don't know if you've noticed, I'm out punting my coverage pretty big time. And so I think back to that moment when I saw Lizzie walking down that aisle at the Chapel of Memories at Mississippi State, and she was gorgeous. She was beautiful. The, the, the one time in all of that where I might shed a tear was in that moment, seeing her come to me and essentially say, hey, man, I, I want to be one with you and I want to be spend my life with you. Uh, the dedication that she was showing by walking down that aisle was just as beautiful as her dress was as she was walking down that aisle. And so that's how that's how it's described, right? That's how we are described. That's how the New Jerusalem is described here in John's vision as a bride walking down the aisle to meet its groom. And it's described as a bride whose radiance will never fade, right? It'll never go away. It will always be that glorious. It will always be that beautiful to God. And then we kind of look, he called it New Jerusalem, but then he said it's a holy city. And the reason why it's a holy city is because Everyone in the city, everything about that city is righteous. It was set apart for a purpose. And in this, in, in the new heaven and in the new earth, it will serve that purpose perfectly, right? All of God's redeemed people living together in perfect harmony for, for, for forever, for beyond time, for all of time. And so no longer are we going to struggle in our relationships, right? Because sin and death are defeated. Uh, no longer are we going to face the issues that we face today because all of those are defeated. But forevermore, we'll be devoted to the same purpose. And that purpose is the glory of God. And so there are a couple of things here that we see at the end of this passage as we get to the end of verses 4 and 5, especially there. We see uh, a couple of things. One is that there's going to be no death. So death is the ultimate consequence of sin. This is uh, so the fall happens before the fall. We, we don't, there is no death. After the fall, death comes as the ultimate consequence of sin. But, but since at this point there is no sin, then without sin there is no death. Death has no place in heaven. Um, death will be thrown in the lake of fire. I think, that, I think that's a sobering thought right now in our time when we're beginning to see so many people lose their lives, some to COVID-19 and some just because, uh, because of sickness that's existed long before. And so there's a hope, there's this, there's a joy that we can have in knowing that that that, that death for those who are believers is temporary, right? That they're going to continue to live in a place where death has no place. So he said there's no death, and he goes on that, that there's no grief. So sin and brokenness, uh, they no longer exist. So without sin and brokenness, therefore there is no grief, you know? And then so from no grief, then you see another tie to no crying. So crying, this outward expression of internal suffering, but there is no grief and there is no sin and there is no death. Therefore, there is no suffering. And so without suffering, there's no need for tears in heaven. So we've got no death and, and no grief and no crying. And then finally, no pain. Uh, pain, the experience of it is first mentioned in Genesis as a consequence of sin, right? That we would toil in pain with the earth to, to get our crops, to, to get food, to feed our families. That Women would uh, experience pain in childbirth. All of this is a consequence of sin, but sin uh, is gone, right? A after the fall, we receive pain, but after Christ, once we're in the new heaven and the new earth, pain will be completely removed So, because sin has been completely removed. So there's no death, there's no grief, there's no crying, there's no pain. All of these old human habits and traits of our nature are gone forever in the new heaven and the new earth. Jesus said, look, I'm making everything new uh, there at the end of his ministry. And so what we see here in Revelation 21 is uh, that reality coming to fruition. We, we see him making good on that promise that he's, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And now he's given a vision to John to see a bit of that place that he's prepared for him. And I think that's uh that, that's an amazing reality. I think the best part 
of that reality is that it's not just in existence, but that we will get to exist in it forevermore with him. So kind of with those things in mind, I have a couple of questions I want you to look at. I'll read through them and then take a moment, pause the video, and you can talk about them with a family, with your family, and then we'll come back and we'll look at them. First question is, what are you most looking forward to about our eternal home? And then the second question, why is it significant that God will dwell with his people? So take a moment, hit pause, the, the questions will show up on your screen, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about them. So I hope that you've had some good discussion. That, that first question we'll look at, um, what are you most looking forward to about our eternal home? So that's a, a personal question, right? And I can't hear you uh, because as I'm recording this, you haven't watched it yet. But for, so for me personally, what am I most looking forward to about our eternal home is definitely no more knee pain, right? Uh, I've had a couple of knee surgeries and I'm looking forward to my knees not hurting anymore. You know, I plan on dunking the basketball a bit in heaven, you know what I'm saying? And, and showing the ups that used to exist that don't exist anymore. Although I don't think that is entirely because of my knees. Uh, so besides knee pain, I, I really, in all seriousness, I look forward to there no longer being a struggle with sin, right? Us and our flesh, we battle with our sin day in and day out. Um, I sin, your youth pastor sins. I think that's something that me and you have in common, actually. And so I look forward to the idea that, that I, I will no longer struggle with sin because sin will no longer exist. And so then that, that second question, why is it, significant that God will dwell with his people. So I think that's significant significant for us to look at, right? That God dwelling with his people because it's, it's just an understanding of the reality that sin is gone, right? Sin separates us from God, but in the new heaven and in, in the new earth, that price has been paid to its fullest. We have been redeemed all the way. The work that was started with Christ here on the earth that's continuing to be worked out even now, as Paul talks about, at this moment will be completed. And so to know that it's over and that it's done, uh, I think that's that's significant for us to realize that our creator then can dwell with us, then can walk with us and be in perfect communion with us because sin no longer exists. So then we, we move on to verses six through eight of chapter 21. And, and that reads, then he said to me, it is done. I'm the alpha and the omega. The beginning and the end, I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So in uh, John 19.30, Jesus says, it is finished. This is something we're going to be looking at as we get closer to Easter. His cry, it is finished, right? And then here, Revelation 21, he says, it is done. So that work uh, that it is finished on the cross, that work that began here in Revelation, we see uh, at, that at this point will be completely redeemed. And Jesus says, it is done. God's new creation is made complete. And so what, what we see here is Jesus' claim here at the beginning. He says that I am the Alpha and the Omega, right? The beginning and the end. Even those two phrases, it is finished and then it is done. We see a beginning of the work and then we see the end of the work. And so a couple of things that we need to realize is that all of history, as he is the Alpha, all of history begins with Jesus. Jesus is God, right? He existed in the very beginning. Uh, he is the creator of all things. So all things exist in him and through him and were created by him. Therefore, every, everything has its beginning in him. So he begins history, but not only does he begin history, he will bring history to an end, right? When history ends, Jesus is still going to exist. Uh, just as all things began with Christ, all things are going to find their end in him as well. So he truly is the beginning and the end. I think that's a super important reality for us to understand as we even think about our own lives and as they come to an end, knowing that Christ was there at the beginning and he's preeminent, he exists even now and he will continue to exist all the way through the end. That our creation, our being is found in him, exists in him and our eternity here at the end will exist in him. And he goes on and he says, he kind of gives some other pictures. He talks about water, right? And, and heaven and, and hell. So the first thing we need to realize is that there is 
a heaven and hell, right? Um, that all the earth that's, that's been corrupted by sin is going to come to an end. And in history, as we know, it's going to come to an end. But that means that all people are going to have to spend eternity somewhere, either heaven or hell. And so as we come to that reality, as Jesus is talking about this here in this vision, he opens the story, kind of looks at this idea of water. And so that water is a symbol for eternal life, right? And so he's offering it to all of those who believe, all those who will surrender to Christ can live in the new heaven and new earth. And, and those who, uh, who admit that they are thirsty, those who believe in Jesus, that he, only he can quench that thirst, um, they're going to experience eternal life in heaven. And so those who experience eternal life in heaven, those who admit that their thirst can only be, be quenched in Christ, they're going to be conquerors, right? Conquerors over sin, not because of their work. No, they're conquerors uh, because Jesus is on the, working on their behalf. He defeats sin on their behalf. So those of us who are believers, we, we realize that we cannot overcome sin in our own power, but we know that Jesus has overcome sin. So when we surrender our life to him, we completely submit our life to him. We say, hey, Jesus, I, I am thirsty and only you can quench my thirst. He makes us conquerors by defeating sin on our behalf. And so while that is an awesome picture, and those of us who believe uh, can look at that with the reality that we're going to spend eternity in heaven when this time comes to an end, we also have to uh, have the understanding and the reality that not everyone is going to spend eternity in heaven, right? Because uh, all of us have fallen short of God's commands, of God's requirements, of the standards, but not all of us have looked and surrendered our life to Christ. Some people choose to remain in sin. Some people choose to not be obedient to Christ, to not submit and give their lives to Christ. And so we need to have that reality that hell exists and people are going to spend eternity there and it's not a good place, you know? And so as we walk through life, we need to, to live with that understanding. But forgiveness is available for all of those who believe, for all of those who submit, for all of those who repent. Forgiveness is available for them. And God is preparing a home where they will live eternally, where we will live eternally. But that is only for those who fully trust in Jesus, who give their whole life to him, knowing that he is the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father uh, or his eternal home except through him. And so with that understanding, I have three questions I want us to look at, and we'll come back and take a quick look at them as well. First question is, how does the promise of eternity impact your life now? Uh, then our second question is, what does it mean for us to conquer? So just kind of a reminder of what we've talked about. And then our final question here for this section, how can you keep the reality of heaven and hell in mind as you relate to others? So take a moment, hit pause, discuss these questions as a home, and then we'll come back and look at them together. So looking at these questions, uh, first one, how does the promise of eternity impact your life now? So again, it's a personal question. Uh, for, so for me, uh, it gives me relief and hope, right? Relief in knowing that uh, the way we live today is not going to exist for forever. Again, in, in this COVID-19 kind of pandemic and this crisis that we're facing, there's definitely some relief in knowing that this isn't forever, that this is just for a moment. And then there's hope, right? So that relief for me leads to hope, a hope of a life that's much better than I've ever experienced, a hope that's much better than I could ever imagine, right? And so that's kind of, um, that's how the promise of eternity impacts my life personally. So then the next question, what does it mean for us to conquer? And I think uh, what, that, what that means is that we've overcome because of Christ, right? It's just a reminder of Christ's work in our life. That's what it means to be conquerors is that we've surrendered our life to Christ. We've allowed him to fight on our behalf, surrendered our pride uh, and our own desire to lead and allowed him to lead us. And then that final question, how can you keep the reality of heaven and hell in mind as you relate to others? And so I believe that that, that reality should dictate our interactions with other people, that as we talk to people who are believers, we talk to them with the reality that we're going to spend eternity with them in heaven and that that whatever we're, issues we're facing now, maybe with them or with others or with just the world surrounding us, 
that those issues are going to disappear. And so as we communicate with one another, we don't have to dwell on those things that are difficult or those things that we're struggling with. We can dwell on the reality that these things are temporary. And then I think as we talk to those who are, who are not believers, who have not surrendered their life to Christ, I think that, again, we have to have that reality of heaven and hell in mind. It's not that we can save those people. We can't. But we absolutely have a responsibility to tell them who can save them. And so uh, in those moments, we cannot let those moments pass away. We have to be uh, intentional in how we talk to them. Again, not as a, as a check mark, but as a, as a duty, as our calling by God as believers to share the gospel. So as we walk through life, we need to live with the reality of a heaven and a hell. So we're going to jump over to chapter 22 in Revelation, looking at verses 1 through 5. And, and these are, this is our last couple of verses we're going to walk through. I want to read them with you. Uh, it says, Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. And the tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So John is has received this vision of the new heaven and the new earth here in Revelation, and we see a picture of an incredible home that's been promised to every believer. What man, what a what a hope, right? What an amazing picture for us to begin to think about and to look here in this passage. And so John kind of focuses in uh, a particular in on, on the New Jerusalem and some images that stand out. And so there's some symbolism that we're going to look at here uh, at these different areas that he's kind of keyed in on. And so the first is the river of the water of life. So we, if you think back to Genesis 2, uh, there is a river that flows through the Garden of Eden. It, 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 and it also, there's also a river that flows in our eternal home. The difference between the river that flows in the Garden of Eden and the river that flows in our eternal home is that the river that flows through our eternal home, the water of life flows from the throne of God. Just a reminder that eternal life, all of eternity, comes from God. From his throne. It's a, a beautiful picture that we can remember that our eternity, we can be appreciative of God knowing that our eternity comes from him. Then the next picture we see is the tree of life. Again, the tree of life is present in the Garden of Eden, but after Adam and Eve sinned, after the fall, uh, no, no longer are, are, is humanity allowed to eat from it. But through Christ's death on the cross, through his resurrection, Jesus removes the curse. And so here we can eat of the tree of life. That's something that we can partake in. And so then he goes from the tree of life, he begins to break down some parts of that tree. So he looks at the tree's fruit. It says that the fruit will bear 12 kinds of fruit, producing a different fruit for every month. And so this is a pic picture of the unending provision and blessings that we receive from God. Uh, today, right, we aren't sure if we can get toilet paper or, or eggs or bread, and so we're just kind of getting whatever we can get. Many people have learned how to cook uh, some bread. I know that at our house, we've made some, some chicken broth, and, and yesterday we've made some butter and then buttermilk, cooked some biscuits with them this morning. I got a great recipe if you're looking for a buttermilk recipe. recipe. Uh, but even so, even now, we are having to rely on the provision of God. But in, in times of difficulty, we don't know for sure that we're going to have something to eat, right? Uh, but we know that, that one day uh, that provision is going to be guaranteed, that that provision, his blessing will be forevermore, right? That he is going to take care of his people as we live in eternity with him. And so he's looked at that with the, the tree's fruit, and then he looks at the tree's leaves. And so these leaves symbolize the full and healthy lives of all those people who are enjoying God's presence, that, that Christ has removed the consequence of sin. He's removed sickness. He's removed death. And those things are gone forever. And so that's what he's kind of talking about when he talks about the tree's leaves. And then, and then finally, he looks at the throne of God. So John saw that the river and the tree, they point back to the Garden of Eden. But the throne of God and of the Lamb, those things were not in the Garden. And so we're given a, a strong reminder that the new Jerusalem will be 
far superior than even the Garden of Eden. I know I have thought before, man, if only an Adam and Eve had not, had not sinned, if only the fall had not happened, it would have been so awesome to be in the garden, right? And so this passage shows us, it tells us, that while I'm sure that was amazing to walk step in step, hand in hand with God through the garden, living in his glory and in perfection, that it was not even as great as this will be, because the throne of God will exist there, and God will rule and reign from his throne in this city. So we've been given this, this picture of our eternal home, but the question a lot of times exists, what, what are we going to be doing when we're there, right? And so uh, popular culture says that we're going to grow wings, and we're going to fly around with with harps and, and constantly singing uh, every day, all day, for their, all of eternity. And, and uh whether that's a comforting picture to you or not, it's not to me. Um, it's also not reality. It, it, nowhere in Scripture does it point that we become angels with harps that fly around and sing in the clouds. Um, but if you do look at Scripture, there are a couple of things that we can determine, right? So the first thing that we can determine, determine is that when, while in heaven, we're going to worship God. Uh, we'll de- we're going to declare His praises. Um, the problem is sometimes we have a shallow view of what worship is, Worship absolutely is singing, but it's far more than singing. Worship can be through studying his word, through prayer. We're going to be there with him, though. Uh, So worship is going to be, we're going to have a full vision of what worship really is with our daily lives, what it looks like to worship God. And so we're going to be worshiping God for all of eternity, bringing him glory. Not only are we going to be worshiping God, but we're going to be serving God. We are called his servants, God's servants. But our service, as we may think about it today, is burden, burdensome to, to serve other people. In this time, it won't be burdensome. No, it, it'll be a joy to serve God. So uh, we can look at the garden even. We can even look throughout Scripture. God gave Adam work to do for him. He gave mankind work to do for him. Uh, and, and even after Adam and Eve sinned, they still had work to do. They had to work the land. There, there were ways that they served God. And so I believe, and Scripture points to the fact that we will serve God in a way that's not burdensome, in a way that brings joy, and again, that brings glory to God. So we're going to worship God. We're going to serve God. But not only are we going to do those things, we're going to reign with God. So God is the sovereign and supreme ruler over all of creation. There is none that matches him, but he grants us the privilege to reign with him forever. So we're going to worship him. We're going to serve him and we're going to reign over creation with him. This is what eternal life is going to look like. This is what uh, believers have, have the opportunity to look forward to. And then he ends this here in verse 6, uh, Revelation 22, 6. And he says, these words are faithful and true. We can know that these things that have been said by Jesus to John in this vision, they are faithful and true. We can have hope in these things. We can place a firm foundation in these things knowing that they're going to come to pass, that this is our eternal reality. What a joy that is. So three questions I want us to look at, and then I'm going to let y'all go after we've kind of talked through them. First question, uh, which of the descriptions of heaven in these verses do you find most meaningful? Uh, Then in our next question, in what ways does knowing how the story ends change your everyday life? And then that final question, what does this passage teach us about the heart of God? So take a moment, pause the video, maybe discuss these three questions amongst yourselves, and then we'll come back, discuss these questions, and then I'm going to give you some further instructions. So coming back, taking a look at these questions, that this first one, which of the descriptions of heaven in these verses do you find most meaningful? So for me, uh, it's definitely the throne, that last one, the throne of God, uh, because it just reminds me that it is whatever whatever is going to exist in is far better than anything and everything that I could imagine or create in my mind or that's ever existed. Uh, it's just a reminder that everything, it, this is going to be so much better than everything else. And so that's a, that's kind of what's meaningful to me. Uh, next, The next question, what ways does knowing how the story ends change your everyday life? And and how, how it kind of changes my life, and I hope and I pray it changes yours, is it causes me to live with boldness and, and courage and hope. I'm not, I'm not questioning what the end of the world is going to look like, right? I'm not questioning where I'm going to spend eternity. I know the answers to those questions. 
I know where I'm going to live for all of eternity. I know what I'm going to be doing. For the most part, I'm going to be worshiping God, serving God, and reigning with God. And so because I know that, because this isn't a gamble, right? This isn't, this isn't a game. I know the truth. I can be bold and courageous as I walk through this world because, because there's nothing to fear. There's nothing for me to be afraid of because I know how the story ends, right? And that gives me hope because uh, I know how it all works out. And so then that, that last question, what does this passage teach us? about the heart of God. And, and I believe that this teaches us about the heart of God. It teaches that he's for us, that he loves us, that he loves his creation. He has created this new heaven and this new earth. He's creating it for us. Uh, he, he is a loving creator. I think it also teaches us that he's merciful. Um, as his creation, he can do with us whatever he wishes. Uh, if he looked at us and said, hey man, uh, sin has entered the world, the fall has happened, and so you're not completing the task that I've called you to do to bring me glory. God it would be in full, right, he would be right and just in just destroying that creation and starting over from scratch. But he didn't do that. He chose to give us a way out. He was merciful and he was loving and he's offered us grace. I think this tells us a lot about God and about his heart. So I hope that you have enjoyed this time as we kind of walk through Revelation 21 and, and then part of 22. I hope that you have, as a family have been able to, to, to discuss this. There are a few more questions, just six more questions that we want you to look at and kind of look at Christ and culture and community and look at how you, you can respond uh, throughout this week based on what you, we've talked about here today. Those are going to pop up here at the end of this video. I hope you'll take a moment to pause the video and look at those questions. Um, I also hope that you'll, you'll join us for our daily devos. Those things are, are posted in your email. If you've given us your email, they're put it on Facebook. You can find links to them on Instagram. You follow our Instagram. They're also on our YouTube page uh, in a playlist called Daily Devos. We would love for you to continue the conversation with us throughout this week about eternal life as Brother Brent leads us for the first three days and then I'll come back for the last two days. Well, anything, church family, we want you to know that we love you and that we're praying for you. Uh, we are walking through this with you. So let us know uh, what this means to you. Let us know how we can pray for you. Uh, let us know how we can meet a need for you. And let us serve you in some way.